This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. All right, so let's, uh, let me ask you a couple questions. We started this uh, unit on uh, energy, uh, conservation of energy, and I did that in the context of needing to uh, cool down a high fructose corn syrup stream, remember that, with some water, and we made a calculation about how much water that would take. And uh, we were stuck with trying to figure out how the size of the piece of equipment called a heat exchanger that we would require in order to accomplish that degree of cooling. And so to answer that question, we had to first explore how energy is transferred. And we found that it's uh, transferred in one of three ways. And what are those? Conduction, Conduction convection, and radiation. Now, which of those three does not require a medium? Radiation. Radiation. And which of those doesn't work if the medium is a solid? Convection, because you're stirring up a fluid, either a liquid or a gas. Now, can conduction happen in a fluid? Sure, it can. But once the fluid starts to move, then energy can also be transported by convection. And typically, once you even get the smallest amount of fluid movement, the convection will overwhelm the conduction. Now, we came up with some equations uh, for conduction. And this law was called what? Uh, Fourier's, Fourier's law. Now, look at this. This is a differential equation. It has a dependent variable temperature, which is a function of what? Huh? Go ahead. X. X. And it has an independent variable, X. And if you integrate this equation, you end up solving for T of X, which is the temperature profile. And we did that for a slab. This equation, this differential equation, applies anywhere in the slab. And if you integrate it from x equals 0 to x equal to L, the thickness of the slab, you find that the heat flow, or the energy flow in BTUs per hour or joules per minute, is equal to the uh, area through which the energy is being transferred times K. And what's K? Speak to me. Thermal conductivity. It's a, it's a function of what? Property of the material. Where do you find it? Harry's. Divided by the length of the material through which the energy is being conducted times the driving force, which is the temperature difference across the material. So if I ask myself, how do I, for a given uh, temperature difference in a given area and a given thickness, if I want to increase the energy flow through it, I can do that by selecting a material that has a higher thermal conductivity. Now, I was asking you a question, and I could tell as I was riding my bike home that I sort of got a deer in the headlight looks from you guys, which meant that I, I either screwed it up or you guys were having a simultaneous neuronal meltdown. Uh, the possibility that 40 of you would be doing that at once probably meant I screwed up. So let's try this again. You remember where I said, put your hand on the two pots, one has a copper bottom and one has a, a concrete bottom? And I turned the gas flame on underneath, and which if you don't like somebody, which hand, which pot are you going to tell them to put their hand in? The copper one, right? That's nasty. Now, if the uh, copper and the cement bottoms are the same thickness, and I have the same, uh, this, the uh, burner set at the same K, 
hue, the same rate of energy flow, so it's the same thickness. The pans are the same size or the same area. Is the temperature gradient steeper in the metal bottom pan or in the concrete bottom pan? And that's because, go ahead. It's less conductive. It's less conductive. So you have the very high temperature on the bottom of the concrete, but it's cooler on top. So the delta T across there is going to be larger, or the temperature gradient, the dt dx, will be larger. So on a metal bottom, where your hand gets obliterated, there's very little temperature gradient across the metal because the bottom of the pan surface is almost the same temperature as the top of the pan surface. And you can see it from this equation here. If Q is the same as it is in both of those pans and the area is the same, the only thing that's different between the two pans is the K. And the K for the copper is very what? Large. So dt dx is going to be small. Whereas with the concrete, k is very small. And so the dt dx that will give you this q has to be large. Okay, so that's how you think about it. I'm not sure what I said. If I didn't say that, would you guys erase that piece of the tape from last time? We don't want to confuse the masses of the world that are listening to this. Now, there's also, another form of energy transfer, and that's convection. And that's where we have a fluid on either side of our slab. And the fluid is out here roughly at T-hot, and over here it's T-cold. Now, the temperature of the wall on either side are different from T-hot and T-cold because the temperature is dropping through this system. And because the fluid is moving, uh, it becomes very difficult to have a material property that tells you something like thermal conductivity does here, which characterizes this. Because what characterizes the ability to conduct energy out here in the fluid is how fast the fluid is moving, what the fluid is, what kind of fluid it is, and therefore it's things like its viscosity and its heat capacity and so forth. So what we do is we wrap that all up into something called H, which has the name of What's the H called? K is what? Thermal conductivity. And what was H? The heat transfer coefficient. And H, when you look at this equation and you look at this equation, you see that H formally has the units of K over L and represents basically a proportionality constant that connects the driving force to the flow of energy. Now, we took that problem and we said, well, in a case where Qx is the same coming through the fluid, through the object, and out into this fluid, we can equate all these, and we did a little bit of algebra, and we came up with an equation for the energy flow through a system which is really a laminate system. It's a fluid, material, fluid system. And we said Q of X is equal to big U times A times the driving force, the difference between the hot and cold temperatures. Big U, you see, has the same units as what? H. And H has the same units as K over L. And the U, we found out, was nothing more than the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals of the heat transfer coefficients and K over L, or L over K. And so that we could formally write this equation as Q of X is equal to the driving force, delta T, divided by the sum of the thermal resistances to give this a look very much like to Ohm's law, where the current is equal to the voltage drop divided by the sum of the resistances for a series circuit where one over the sum of the thermal resistances is just U times A. So 
I want to take that off now and uh, depart there and show you how you can take this information and design a heat exchanger. And by that I mean size the heat exchanger by determining the amount of area that's going to be required to transfer a particular amount of energy. So this is called the heat exchanger. Now, heat exchangers can take different geometrical forms. And the heat exchanger that I'm going to use for purposes of uh, today's lecture is what's called a shell and tube heat exchanger. And it has a tube or a pipe through which our, and I'll try to make this uh, real. So here's our high fructose corn syrup coming in. And remember, we wanted to cool it. Comes out the other side, presumably it's cool. How do we make it cool? Well, we can put this, another pipe around this, therefore shell in tube, and flow water through the annular region. So you have cold water coming in and you have hotter water coming out because some energy has left the high fructose corn syrup stream and entered the water stream, thereby cooling the high fructose corn syrup stream and warming the water stream. Now what governs this, of course, is the need to conserve energy. Now if you take this little piece of, of wall, you see what I've done, the circle here, and I've blown it up. So what you see here is the green is the little cross section of the wall of the pipe separating the water on the outside from the high fructose corn syrup down here below. And over a little distance delta x, a little differential length delta x, we will transfer from the high fructose corn syrup to the water a little bit of energy, delta q r, r meaning in the radial direction, q having the units of what? Energy per time. Energy per time, okay? Now, the temperature of the water coming into this little element at some distance x down the pipe is T water at temper T water of x. And coming out, it's T water at x plus delta x. Because what's happening to the temperature over this little delta x? Is it rising or dropping for the water? Well, it's rising because you see it's taking up some heat here from the high fructose corn syrup. The flow rate of water is MW, and it's the same coming in as out because there's no way for the water to escape. And there's no way for it to build up in here. This is a piece of metal. This isn't made out of a balloon. And the high fructose corn syrup comes in at temperature THFCS for high fructose corn syrup at point X, and it departs at a different temperature, which, if this is working, will be a little bit lower than what came in. And M is the mass flow rate in pounds per hour or grams per second of high fructose corn syrup. Now what we do is do some energy balances, conserve energy. Now one is a balance you've already seen before, which says the total amount of energy that's going to be transferred from the beginning of our device to the end of our device, Q, is, can be computed in two ways. It's the amount of energy, of course, that's taken up by the water, which is the mass of the water times the heat capacity of the water times the difference between the water temperature out minus the water temperature in. Mind you, the water temperature coming out is higher than in but it's equivalent to the amount of energy given up by the high fructose corn syrup stream, which is the mass flow rate of high fructose corn syrup times the heat capacity times the difference in temperature across the entire device. We call that the overall energy balance because we've made that energy balance over the entire device from one end to the other. Now we can also make a differential energy balance. See this little Q of R? We can ask the question, how much energy is transferred from the high fructose corn syrup to the water over this little uh, differential distance delta x? We'll call that delta qr. And we can come down here to the equation that we derived, because isn't this a fluid 
a solid wall and a fluid. It's exactly what we did here last time. So I can apply this equation. Delta Q of R is equal to big U times, well, what's this in the parentheses? It's the area. 2 pi R, the circumference, times delta X is the area through which energy is being transferred, times what? Well, the temperature difference between this side and that side, THFCS minus TW. Well, actually what I've put in is the temperature right at the beginning. Because what am I going to be doing to this equation, do you think, in time? What's going to happen to delta x? It's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until, in fact, the temperature will be approximated by the temperature coming in, in across each of these walls. So let's take this analysis a little bit further and see what we can do with these two energy balances, an overall energy balance and a differential energy balance. So let's look at the high fructose corn syrup side of things to start with. So can someone tell me what I've done here? Look back at the little box on the previous page under differential energy balance, a little diagram. What, have I, what does this represent here, this first equation? Yeah, go ahead. Be a little louder. Energy in is equal to energy out, and plus accumulation. Right. So this is the energy that's coming in with the high fructose corn syrup stream on the left-hand side has to equal the energy that's leaving that little element. Plus, you see, delta Q R is the energy that's leaving and going into the water. See, that's a balance. And if I then just rearrange this, and I'll let you admire that for yourself. If you rearrange it, you get this little thing over here where you get these two temperatures divided by a delta x, and you take the limit as delta x gets really small, and this approximates a what? A, remember, why did you take calculus uh, 51, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? To know that this is a derivative, all right? And so we get this expression. We actually get an ordinary differential equation expression for the change in temperature with distance down our heat exchanger, which is related to the temperature difference across the wall, the area over which the energy is being transferred, divided by the mass flow rate of HFCS and its heat capacity. Now, I can do the same thing on the water side, can't I? I have to balance the energy on the water side. So the amount of energy coming on into the water side is the amount that's being brought in plus that which is being taken up from the high fructose corn syrup equals the amount of energy leaving in the water. And I can do the same machination here. I get another, another differential equation, which is for the temperature as a function of distance down this little piece of a delta x. But since I've taken the limit, this differential equation applies where along my device? At every what? Every point along the device, at any point x. Thinking about that, if I add these two boxed equations together, just add them together, you can see that I can add the make a new dependent variable, which is simply the temperature difference, HFCS minus TW. Okay, so just add these two together, and I get this equation, which is a differential equation where the dependent variable is actually the temperature difference across the wall. When you see an equation like this, what primal urge do you have? Integrate. Integrate, yes. Oh. Yes. Integrate. So you start by putting integral signs in front of it and noting that the dependent variable here now is a temperature difference. It's 
so that when I put the limits on my integral, the limit THFCS minus T water is THFCS minus T water out, coming out of the right-hand side of the device, and the lower limit is the temperature difference of between the two streams coming into the device. And I integrate from zero to L, dx. All this comes out of the integral because it is a constant. And when you have something like dx over x and you integrate it, what function does that generate? A natural log. And you see there was a minus here in front. I got rid of it because I inverted the log. And this is the answer I get after integration. Now, let's go back to the overall balance. It's probably back two pages maybe in your notes or one. How many pages is the overall balance? You remember that? No, it's right here. How many pages back is that? Just one now? The figure, the page that has the two diagrams on it, here's the overall balance. I just rearranged it. This is the overall Q that gets transferred based on water, the overall Q that gets transferred based on the high fructose corn syrup stream. And I can, if you'll notice, you'll see that this 1 over MWCPW appears here, and 1 over MHFCS CPHFCS appears here. So I can substitute these temperature differences divided by the amount of energy being transferred into this equation, and I get this equation. Now this might look complicated, but it's really not, because do you see that this temperature difference is just something I can call delta T left. It is the temperature difference between the water and the high fructose corn syrup stream coming into the device. It's on the left-hand side of the drawing. And delta T right is simply that same temperature difference between those two process streams coming out the right-hand side of the device. So I can write this equation a little bit more simply by solving it for Q, the heat flow. So you get 2 pi R L U, and I get the log delta T over delta T right coming over. And I get an equation, if you look at this very carefully, it looks like nothing more than an area times an overall heat transfer coefficient times a weird kind of temperature difference. And we call this temperature difference delta T sub LN for log mean. But I want you to see that this equation looks just like this equation over here in the same kind of thing, except the temperature difference is this kind of strange one. It involves uh, these delta T lefts and delta T rights. So let me explain what we've done here. What we've done is when we had this simple slab, the temperature T1 and T2 were held constant. But when you're a little high fructose corn syrup molecule going down this device and you're getting cooler, do you see that the temperature is changing all the way down the device? And the temperature of the water is changing all the way down the device? So what we have to do, we've come up with sort of an average driving force by doing the differential mass uh, energy balances, and they look something like this. So here's the co-current device, and by co-current I mean both fluids are running down the tubes in the same direction. So let's look at this picture and I think it will help you understand this. Here is the high fructose corn syrup coming in at temperature Tn, right here. Here it is coming out, it's cooler. The water comes in down here and it gets warmed up. Now, you can see that the temperature difference, where is the driving force the greatest in this device? At the beginning or the end? Beginning. At the beginning of the device. So where do you think more energy is transferred in the device? At the beginning of the device or the end of the device? Beginning. At the beginning because my driving force is the highest. However, when all is said and done, I've transferred big Q, the Q. But if you think about it, I'm adding up all these little delta Qs along the way to add up to big Q. And it's what delta Q is changing because the temperature difference is changing. 
And what the log mean temperature does is it allows you to calculate what the effective temperature difference is for this device. And we did that by integrating the balances from x equals zero to x equal L, the end of the device. Now, this has an interesting constraint to it. Can T water out ever exceed T high fructose corn syrup out? Nope. Why not? Second law. What? The second law. The second law. That is one of the most profound answers I have heard. It's absolutely right. I hadn't thought of that, actually, in those terms. I just think of it in the terms, I don't see how suddenly the water can start getting hotter than the high fructose corn syrup can be getting colder, so that's an engineer's way. These lines can't cross. What, uh, but what could, could I have T high fructose corn syrup out equal T water out? Is that a possibility? Long tube. Yeah, if I had an infinitely long tube, they might finally, you know, come. Imagine it's like um, driving uh, to the goal line by having your distance each play. That's an infinitely long football game because you never quite get there. So this has this interesting constraint that T high fructose corn syrup out will be greater than or equal to T water out. Now. Who says I have to run my heat exchanger with the two streams going in the same direction? What other option would I have? Hmm? Erica, a counter current. I could run the fluids in opposing directions called a counter current flow device. So let's take a look at what we might expect the temperature profile in this device to look like as I go from the beginning of the device to the exit. So we're going to call this the inlet of the device, because that's where our process stream is coming in, our high fructose corn syrup. We'll call this the outlet of our device. But now I've turned the water around. So here's the high fructose corn syrup coming in hot, and it's getting cooled. Now, here's the water coming in. And the water is getting warmed up as it moves in this direction. Is it possible now that T water out can actually be warmer than T high fructose corn syrup out? Was that a possibility in co-current? No. So you see what counter-current buys you? it releases that constraint slightly. And if you release that constraint, what does your intuition tell you about which of these two devices might be more capable of transferring energy, everything else remaining the same, the areas, the lengths, and so forth? Countercurrent. Countercurrent. Because now the constraint is that the high fructose corn syrup temperature coming out that's been cooled only has to be greater than the temperature of the cooling water coming in. So this simple transposition of these streams seems to have provided us with a lesser constraint on the temperatures and therefore perhaps afforded us a more efficient device. So let's see if that's really true. Here's our design equation. And this thing in the box is called the design equation. This is how you design a heat exchanger. Because what we're really looking for in the heat exchanger is the area. And the area in this heat exchanger is a combination of the radius of the tube and how long the tubes are. So here's our original specification. Do you recall we had high fructose corn syrup coming in at 65 degrees? And I said we had river water at 15 degrees. And that we had to cool this high fructose corn syrup down to 20. And the water going out could not be any warmer than 30 because we'd fricassee the fish in our river. Now, can this be accomplished using a co-current configuration? And don't look at the answer. Tell me why it can't. Your water out is a higher temperature than your. Our water out is a higher temperature than 
the high fructose corn syrup coming out. That would mean the streams would have had to cross. We can't do that. So let's relax this temperature constraint. Because you see, you didn't take E20, and you hadn't learned about counter current exchangers. So you said, the only way I can solve this problem is to say, OK, if I can't do this, I'll do something else. So I still have my high fructose corn syrup coming in at 65 degrees, and my water from my river coming in at 15. But let's not cool the high fructose corn syrup down so far. Let's don't take it to 20. Let's take it to 35. And uh, let's have the water only get to 25, and we'll save some fish. Now, will this work for a co-current exchanger? Okay. It should be OK, because the high fructose corn syrup is coming out warmer than the water is coming out. So it should work. We should now be able to take these temperatures, plug them into this equation, and solve for the area, A. Of course, I need to find U. Where do I find U again? Paris. Paris. OK, very good. So let's, before we turn the page, Tell, someone tell me what delta, what you would plug in for delta T left. What's that? Go ahead, just talk. 65 ahead. minus 15. 65 minus 15, so you plug in what? Someone do on their calculator. 50. OK, 40. 50. Going, going. 50. 50, OK. And what's delta T right? 35 and 25. So 35 minus 25, which is 10. 10 in my book. And let's see what happens. Nothing. Everything. OK. There it is right here. There's where we plugged it in. 50 minus 10, log 50 over 10. So. The delta T log mean is 24.85 degrees centigrade. That's the effective temperature driving force in this co-current exchanger that I'm going to plug into my uh, delta T log mean equation. Now, of course, the other thing I need is to solve for, here's our, my delta T log mean equation. So I'm going to have to look U up in Perry's. I just calculated delta T log mean. So I need to get Q. So for Q, what is this? What's this number? High fructose corn syrup coming into my, my heat exchanger. What is this? E capacity. E capacity of high fructose corn syrup. OK, I'll get, what is this? All right, that's a conversion. What's this? Temperature difference. Temperature difference that? On the left. The, on the left? No, the high fructose corn syrup. No, that's a high fructose corn syrup. That's the temperature difference it's undergoing. And what is this? Another conversion. So I get 7 times 10 to the 7th BTUs per day. That's the amount of energy that has to be transferred across this heat exchanger. How else could I have calculated that very same number? Use the water. I could use the water side if I knew the water flow rate. Okay. But I know the high fructose corn syrup flow rate has been given to me. And in fact, if I have to calculate this, uh, this Q, which we just did, how, what would I use this Q to back calculate on the water side? The flow rate. The flow rate. All right. There you go. So now I've got everything I need, except we need a U. So Bear with me. I'll show you where I got this in a minute. I go to Perry's, and I find that big U is 250 BTUs per hour square foot Fahrenheit. I solve my equation for A. Here it is. I plug in Q. I plug in this U. I plug in this delta T log mean. And I get that the area of my exchanger is 262.2 square feet. And now I have to see how many pipes am I going to have, and what size are they? So I go down to the hardware store, and I find there's a sale on two-inch pipes. And they happen to be 10 feet long. 
So can you picture that I could take a bunch of 10-foot pipes and bundle them together in one? Yeah, Emerson? Does this assume you have an infinitely thin pipe where the internal diameter and external are the same? Yeah, so do you notice how I put UI here and AI? So typically, you will base this either on the internal area of the pipe or the external area. Typically, it doesn't mean squat because uh, you know we're engineers. Don't get too excited. If it means squat, you're probably working with like one inch thick pipes and you should get a new major. So uh, it's a good question and it's, it, and it's the right question, but typically we ignore it, although I did put it in here, the AI and the A zeros to show you that you, you can think about in basing it on the outside or the inside areas, but it won't matter when you get down to these kinds of numbers. So, and I'll show you even in a minute why it even matters even less, because we're going to get into some real engineering here in a second. So it's 262.2 square feet. So two inch pipes that are 10 feet long. The question is, is how many pipes do I need? How many pipes do I walk out of the hardware store with? So you look up the area of one pipe, and this is, happens to be the internal, you know, the inside area, because I gave you an ID. But, but again, it's not going to matter all that much. So I get 5.23 square feet per pipe. I need this much square feet. Now, you, are you not going to, I want 50.13 pipes, please. What, how many are you going to walk out with, 50 or 51? 51. Very good. You guys are real engineers. <laughs> now, let me ask the question, if I were to do this in counter current, the only thing I need to change in my calculation is to go back and calculate what? The delta T log mean. Remember, it's delta T left minus delta T right. So I'm subtracting different temperatures in delta T left and delta T right. So help me, why is delta T left 40 in counter current. What temperatures am I subtracting? 65 minus? 65 minus 25? Everyone would agree? 65 is the high fructose corn syrup going in. 25 is the water coming out. Why do I get 20 here for delta T right? Okay. 35 minus 15. 35 minus 15. 28.85 degrees centigrade. What was delta T log mean for co-current? 24.85. 24. Do you see? I get an effectively higher average temperature driving force when I run counter current. What's that going to do to my area? going to get smaller. In fact, it's 225.8 square feet, and I only need 44 pipes to do exactly the same thing. Now, this is usually where I get the question. Why would you build a co-current heat exchanger? You wouldn't. A Berkeley grad would. You wouldn't. Because they can't get this far in the class. They get stuck on co-current, you see? They never get really told the secret. I'm Yoda, <laughs> and I've just given you the force. I know, you wonder, am I in therapy? Yes. <laughs> Where did I get big U? Where do I go to get big U? I'm waving it. Perry's. Perry's. Here's Perry's, don't ever forget, table 1010. Typical overall heat transfer coefficients in tubular heat exchangers. Hmm, that's exactly what we have here. And I'm looking for what? Big U. Big U. But oh my god, look at this. What am I going to do? Look at all these numbers. Tell me where you look on this table to get big U for this problem. Where? Third. Just Third. guide me. Design. Say down, up, left, right. I am a, 
I am now a human mouse. Okay, what do you want? Left. Getting cold. Right. Stop. Okay, stop. We stopped at <laughs> ethanol, <laughs> amine. Okay. Right column, okay. No. 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 Speak to me. Guide my hand. I'm a human mouse. Down. Up, down, down. 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 Stop. Stop. Organic. Organic solvents and brine. No. All right. Where are we going to go now? Keep going down. Oh, wait, we have shell side materials. What? What? Wax, dis. Oh, water, water. Yeah. We don't have water, water. How about asphalt and Dalther vapor? That is too cool. Imagine pouring asphalt at 450 degrees through that sucker. Remember, we're looking at what fluid's on the shell side, what fluid is on the tube side. You got me down to water, water. The shell side is water, the tube side is paper disc. Okay, the tube side is high fructose corn syrup. What does NC mean? Organic salt. Where? What are you looking at? Oh yeah, non-condensable gas present. V is a vacuum. A is atmospheric pressure, and dirt. We're gonna get to the dirt in a minute. So, all right, you you start crying because there's no high fructose corn syrup in the table. So you burn your peris and you become a sociologist. You don't need to do that. What is high fructose corn syrup? for the most part. Water. water. So what's a good engineering approximation? Water water. water, water. Oh my god, it's 200 to 200. What am I going to pick? <laughs> Why don't they give me the number? And 180. Yeah, 180, you know, pick something here. 200, Why 200. Do you something outside of it? <laughs> but wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. There's another column. What is it? The total it's the total dirt column. You see, and this is engineering. Do you really expect this heat exchanger when you're pumping all this garf through it to stay clean for all of its life? Yes. Yes. Go to psychiatry. It's going to get nasty and it's going to get filthy. And it's going to have dirt. And look what now, oh, tell me what the units of the dirt column are. Bunch. H. Where are you? Do you see them? Squared times three. Look at it. And what is the dirt column <laughs> units? How do they? H the inverse H. of U. U. So you see why these numbers are really small? Because if you take one over these numbers, they get big, like these. So. They tried to fake you out here, you see? Because people who haven't taken this class might add those two numbers together. That would be a big, big mistake. Now, if you've got basically two columns of U's, do you add U's together? How do they add? Remember the series? One over. One over. So, one over what I'll call U effective, the U that we'd really expect is going to be one over, let's say, 250, or you might pick 200, plus what? Plus what? Zero point what? Zero zero three. Is it three? Plus zero. That's right. That's right. All right. And so this turns out to be, when you solve it, a U effective equal to 143. So you see, if you had just read the table and used 200 to 250, you still would have been way off. This is why we don't worry about the thickness of the tubes. Because we've got this wild ass, I'm sorry, cut that, this wild set of numbers here between 200 and 250, and then we throw the dirt in. 
And so the real number is coming out to be about 143. So what do we need to do about the calculations we just did for the number of pipes where we got 44 pipes? That was based on what? A U of 250. So you'd have to go back, plug in a U of, say, 143 or 140. Now that means, of course, when you turn your heat exchanger on and you start running it, it's going to be a bit more uh, able to transfer energy when you first start it up. But once it starts getting the dirt on it and it gets down to this, you're still able to make the design calculation Q that you needed to transfer. If you hadn't done that, You'd be looking at the outlet of this high fructose corn syrup and it's coming out warmer and warmer and warmer as time goes on because the efficiency of your exchanger is going down, down, down because the U's changing. So you might say, how do you design anything on this? I mean, you got 200 to 250, you got the dirt. I mean, that's life. Get used to it. it just adds to the that's forward. just the way engineers do things. And stop crying. If you want precise stuff, be a physicist. So this is what heat exchangers look like. They're very cool devices. So this is a true shell and tube heat exchanger where you have one tube in the middle and, and an annulus and an outer tube. And why do you think they do this? They can take up less space. This takes up less space. All right. Now, you can make them like this where you have a whole bunch of tubes and a manifold here. So the manifold allows your tube fluid in, then it goes through each of these little tubes and comes out the other end. Your total area, of course, is the area of all these tubes. And then you have one big shell. You have the fluid all washing around all of these tubes. And so you get you know, a, a different kinds of designs. Now, I had, I'll finish off by telling you a very cool consulting case I had. I'm gonna show you how you make lots of money knowing this. Uh, out in a place called Ripon, out by Modesto. There's the world's largest egg co-op. They call me up. They say, Dr. Yoda, we need your help. We have a big problem. I say, what is it? We got chickens. Okay, keep talking, buddy. Keep talking. Chickens, what are the chickens doing? Chickens are laying eggs. Imagine, you go to the market, you find the eggs, right? How does the market know how many people are going to come in and buy eggs that day? How do the chickens know how many people are going to come in and buy eggs? They're just sitting there, bloop, 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 out come the eggs, right? Or, you know, how they come out. And so the eggs go and get put in the little cartons based on the order that the grocers put in. And then there's a whole bunch of eggs left over. Those go to the plant and rip on. And they come in in huge, huge crates. A thing that looks like an octopus comes down and lifts something like 800 eggs up at a time and drops them on a little car wash. Have you ever seen what an egg looks like when it comes out of a chicken? Well, it looks like an afterbirth. I mean, it's not pretty. It's all gnarly, and so you've got to clean it off. And so it goes through this, it gets dropped into this little thing, and it goes through wash, and it washes it in a little spray just like a car wash, a little baby car wash. And the, but these eggs are moving really fast, and then they disappear through a wall. And I says, what's on the other side of the wall? And it says, well, it's our, our, our nose detector. I really? So I have to put on a gown. I go in the other wall, and there's this. The eggs are going in, and they're going into things like about the size of a merry-go-round. And at the end of it, it's a hammer. And the hammer drops and breaks the egg. The yolk comes out, and being heavier, it slides out this way. The white goes this way, and it's an egg separator. But the problem is, when you're running, oh, maybe, uh, I don't know what they run, 2,000 eggs a minute. Uh, if you get one bad egg, and they break it, and it falls in this big barrel where all these other eggs have been dropped, it's gone if you get a rotten egg. So they have a person sitting there. And when a rotten egg comes through, as it passes in front of their nose, they can smell it, because it's generally sulfur that you smell. Your nose is really sensitive, more sensitive than anything else. There's no sort of like mechanical nose that's really good at this. And then there's a big red button that says stop. And the person goes boom, stops this thing, pulls out the rotten egg, and then turns the machine on again. They get paid big bucks to do this. You have the big nose, you sit there. <laughs> so then what happens? Now you've got all this stuff. You know what they do with this stuff? 
Well, they remix it, the yolks with the whites, and they make things like egg beaters, you know, which is not so much yolk and more white. Or all, you ever go order French toast in an omelet in a restaurant? Those eggs aren't broken by the chef. They're brought in in cartons, and they just pour it out. Because the worst thing you can do is have order a fried egg in a restaurant and have some grease monkey breaking the egg, you know, and you know, God knows what he's been doing, and then it gets into your thing, it gets cooked, and you eat it. And salmonella, oh man, it's nasty. You want French toast, you want omelets, you want that sinus that comes out of the box. Now, how do I know it doesn't have salmonella? Because I told him how to design the heat exchanger to run this egg mass through, heat it up long enough to kill all the bacteria, and then you put it in boxes and ship it off to the restaurants. Now, they had a problem. It was designed by a chemical engineer from a southern state. <laughs> And they turned this sucker on, and they started running the eggs through it. First time they'd used it. And by the time, all of a sudden, the pressure started going way up on the pump system. And they had turned this into scrambled eggs inside the device, and it had become one solid mass. Because <laughs> they had heated it up too much, and they cooked them. So I had to come in and say, here's how you do the temperature. I was just using this stuff here, right here. We got some dirt, oh dirt, how do you calculate? Don't worry, let the good doctor do his work here. The dirt, and I've got my Perry's and a calculator. Do all these calculations. I was actually doing my taxes. They thought I was doing my calculations. You can make it look, you know, you're charging hourly, so you can't do this in like two minutes. You know, six hours later, get my taxes done, and I've done the calculation the first three seconds. It's over, this is how you do it. Remember this, this stuff, you'll retire doing this stuff. You'll retire when you're 23 years old. It's good. <laughs> All right, we're out of here. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.